first hands and have a seat. Okay, okay we're going to get started. And thank you everybody for coming today. Welcome, welcome. This is a subcommittee meeting. As you see, it's a little bit different format than we do during the regular legislative season. Uh, it's a little bit more informal. The committee, the Criminal Justice Committee, uh, heard this one bill, and the committee decided to vote it interim study. Hi. And so this is for the benefit of the audience who may not know the process. And the more I explain it, the better I'll understand it myself. <laughs> Particularly, Bill, we're in the second year of the, of the biennium, so bills, they have to either get passed or killed by the second year, or they're done. You can't overlap to the next year, which is a whole new biennium, whole new term. So, this bill was voted interim study, which means we're supposed to discuss it during the summer. A subcommittee was formed, the four of us, not, not Representative Swinford, but the four of us, and a fifth who's not here. Maybe we'll have uh, Lane sit in as the fifth to discuss this bill. The only thing we're really here to decide is whether to recommend to the full committee, the Criminal Justice Committee, on whether to, whether there's some good substance to the bill, HB 553, and whether we think it should come back in a different iteration next year as proposed legislation. So, if the subcommittee thinks that 553 in general is a good thing or a great thing, then we may recommend to the full committee that yeah, somebody should put in an LSR, which is a request for bill, LSR for next year, um, to get this kind of language voted on and discussed next year. Or we may say, no, it's not worth it. Whatever we decide today in the subcommittee, we're going to recommend to the full committee. And the full committee is meeting when? Um, end of October. So end of October, the Criminal Justice Committee will meet in 204 to go over four or five bills that were kept over for interim study. Right? This is only one of four or five subcommittees discussing different bills. So that's the process. And we, we ex welcome your comments. As Brad, and it's up to me as the chairman of the subcommittee to uh, hear comments from the committee and from you guys. But it's not necessarily the same formal testimony process, right? So you don't have to fill out a pink card or anything. And I'll invite you guys to kind of share your ideas with us. Since you're here, you've made a trip up to Concord. I really appreciate that. <clears throat> but I don't want you know, long essays. We don't really need that because it's, it's informal. You're not even recording it, huh? You've got some recording? Uh, I don't know if, if Mr. Allman wants to record it. He's welcome to. And I think it's a public space, so you don't need our permission. I'm not going to charge you with a felony for audio over here recording, even though there's a police officer in the room. Hopefully, he's not going to arrest you for that. No? No? <laughs> not today. Different not jurisdiction. Today. Oh, not today. Well, I could, I could end up filing a civil suit against them, too, so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, for House Bill 553, this bill is relative to the, wall, the law on wiretapping and eavesdropping. And we had a couple of bills earlier in the year that dealt more with uh, recording public officials and what was a private conversation, what wasn't. But this particular bill that we're supposed to talk about today is a little different. And it came out of a subcommittee similar to this from two years ago, which said, yeah, maybe we should update the statute because the wiretapping and eavesdropping was eavesdropping the statute goes back to the 70s, I believe, currently, and really when they just had landline phones, right, before cell phones. And the final report of that other committee suggested that uh, we update the language to include all sorts of uh, new technology, and things like telecommunication, communications common carrier have been replaced with updated technology with wireless and uh, other, other types. So. I want to first of all go around the, the subcommittee and teach what you guys, the, what your thoughts were and your comments. Uh, Bill, you want to start with you? What do you think? Well, my sense of it is there's something good here, and uh, we've heard a lot of testimony. We have some good ideas about how it can be improved, <coughs> and uh, I would be in favor of us working on it, seeing what we can get out of it. Mm -hmm. 
the, I'm sorry, I should just call you Representative Ginsburg. On the, on the bill itself, 553, the way we, it was introduced, um, do you kind of like, do you like that, that language? Do you think it has merit? Is it still need tweaking? Because they've added a number of, of terms. And what if you think that that is, is necessary? Do we need that sort of updating? Uh, I don't know what kind of specific uh, things you have in mind. Uh, I'll call you representative too, Mark. Uh, <laughs> I don't care. You call me Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the, <laughs> the courtesy. Uh, not necessary. Um, but, uh, uh, but of course, it does need updating because the technology has changed so much. Uh, and, and, but the idea, I think, is a good one. And uh, it is something that I think we should work on. And for the benefit of people who haven't seen the bill, it's pretty long. Um, wow, 10, 12, 14 pages. And a lot of it was, if not written by, at least pushed, uh, supported by the Attorney General's office, I believe. And they wanted to change the word telecommunication to wire, comma, electronic, or oral communication. So they, they wanted to use the terms wire and electronic instead of the word telecommunication. Right, is that your understanding? Unfortunately, it's kind of a long bill. Typically, we don't like these these long ones because it's a way to hide things in them. So, Representative Welch, what was your take on this? Well, my understanding of it is that when this was put in many years ago, since then the federal law has changed, and the federal law has, has progressed. I hate to say it, but they've actually progressed with the times, <laughs> and we haven't. Mm -hmm. So, I think that there is something here that, that we need to look at. I definitely think there's a need for, for uh, a bill similar, this bill or a bill similar to this passing for next year. Um, finding a lot of our public officials are being accountable, uh, not necessarily just the law enforcement, but local and state officials as well. And I was pretty um, upset myself with the verdict the other day on concerning that case. Um, especially considering that they were school employees, public officials, mm -hmm. quote unquote. Um, and I was very surprised that that verdict was given as guilty for him. I thought there would have been uh, a non-guilty verdict or at least some type of uh, maybe charge of misdemeanor, if anything, you know, but not a felony. Do I understand it correctly that uh, there were three charges, and one of them, for example, was just recording the secretary enter the phone and then transfer the call. Yeah. And felony. And the and the other charge was mm -hmm. um, the other charge was excessive force, but that was on video that that didn't happen. But it was still charged. Yeah. Yeah. That was a separate incident. Separate. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Super, would you like to be added as a replacement for President Panel Office? Is there an official member of the subcommittee? She'll be here. Okay. But what are your thoughts on this? I'm just the chairman listening in. Oh, you're keeping an eye on me? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I saw you slip Bill uh, your card and say, hey, if he says anything, we should get a video and send me a copy. <laughs> well, I have a little different take on this. And while I agree the statute is old, and archaic and out of, it's not up to date. I think it's the purpose of this bill is the least of our worry. At least what we saw in this, this week's uh, trial conviction and others uh, like the audio recording of the police and where and such is the problem is with the existing statute on what is considered illegal, what's considered a felony, what's considered a misdemeanor. That's much more of a problem than whether we call it telecommunication or wire or um, uh, wire electronic communication. I think the fact that this bill expands it only gives more room for law enforcement to abuse the people, to find them guilty of things that they don't like that are trying to sh simply shine, uh, shine the light on accountability and transparency of the government. So I definitely think the law, the statute needs to be updated, but mainly in regards to the definition of what is oral communication, what is uh, 
acceptable for notification, like is it single party or two party notification. Uh, you know, in other states, as long as one person is party to the com uh, communication, the phone call, you can record it. Single party um, knowledge. And others require a notification. And obviously, if you tell the other person you're recording, he can either hang up or continue. If he continues, then he knows he's being recorded. That shouldn't be against the law. But here it's, I think, two-party consent. The, the law is confusing. It's hard to understand. It's not clear. And I think that just makes it that much easier for the government to misinterpret, misconstrue, the, uh, the law to the disadvantage of the people. And I'm here to represent the people. We, the legislative branch, so to represent the people, not, not the administration, not the departments, not the agencies, not the law enforcement. They're the executive branch. They're supposed to enforce the laws that we make representing the people. So that's my take. Um, so since you guys came up, I'd like to invite some comments on this, if you can try to keep your comments towards the bill we're talking about, which is expanding it to include wire and uh, electronic communications, that would be helpful. And also, we don't want to, you don't need to go on all day. Keep your comments short, brief, to the point. But I think it has certainly come to a head this week. I'm glad we have a chance to discuss it. So, starting in the back row, if any of you, Will or Kelly, you guys have anything you want to share with the subcommittee? Don't feel compelled to. Don't feel compelled to. Daryl, since you stayed up late. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I'll give you, you have a copy. Testimony, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you file. a copy of this okay. uh, if you want to place it in file. Yeah. Uh, as most of you know, you know, this past Monday, Edimo was found guilty of three felonies of uh, wiretapping because okay. he reported. Daryl, would you introduce yourself for the oh, committee? Yes. Uh, Daryl Perry. And where do you uh, live? From Keene. Okay. Thank you. Uh, was found guilty of three felonies for recording telephone conversations with public officials. Uh, and, you know, he did not have their consent. And yes, he did violate the New Hampshire statute, but the New Hampshire statute violates federal court precedent. Uh, last year, the first circuit court out of, I believe it's Boston, issued the Glick decision, which uh, the Judges ruled that filming public officials while on duty is, quote, a basic and well-established liberty safeguarded by the First Amendment. The First Circuit Court ruling was cited by a judge in Illinois as a pervasive authority for ruling on similar cases, specifically the case of Michael Allison, who had been convicted of five counts of felony eavesdropping and sentenced to 75 years in prison. The Illinois law, similar to the New Hampshire law, makes it a felony to record a conversation without consent of all parties, regardless of circumstances. Uh, Mr. Allison's troubles began when he recorded his encounters with police who seized his car from his front yard. He then recorded a uh, court appearance without the judge's consent. In all, he was you know, convicted five times of felonies. Uh, another judge in the Allison case dismissed the charges, stating a statute intended to prevent unwarranted intrusion into a citizen's privacy cannot be used as a shield for public officials who cannot assert a comparable right to privacy in their public duties. Such action impedes the free flow of information concerning public officials and violates the First Amendment right to gather information. The ACLU has even stepped in in Illinois and is challenging the Illinois law in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, Illinois, just like New Hampshire, is one of the, or two of the dozen states that require all parties to give consent. This restriction makes it a crime in many circumstances to attempt to hold public officials accountable. This reminds me of a quote from Plato that says, we can easily forgive a child who is afraid of the dark. The real tragedy is when men are afraid of the light. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask the subcommittee to modify RSA 570-A colon two, 
so that the term all parties is replaced with at least one party. And additionally, include the phrase, which I take from the Hawaii statute, it is neither an invasion of privacy, nor wiretapping, nor eavesdropping to record a telephone conversation if a party to the conversation. At the very least, the committee should bring New Hampshire law in compliance with federal court precedent, which states filming public officials while on duty is a basic and well-established liberty safeguarded by the First Amendment. Uh, bring the law into compliance with federal uh, you know, with uh, federal precedent the easy way through legislation or the hard way through court. I know the state does not want to be sued, but uh, if the legislature does not bring this into compliance, I'm tempted to challenge this in federal court and would wiretap as many legislators as possible to make that happen. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, and you'll just give me a copy of that for a yes. while? Okay. Thank you, Joe. If you guys want to sit down, uh, there's some open seats over here out there cells if you don't want to stand. Uh, we're a bit informal today, Representative. How are you? Yeah. <coughs> I'm not sure. Daryl, she said, is it uh, under federal law? Is it just one uh, Federal court precedent when involving public officials. Only one party? Yes. Uh, that's regarding okay. public officials while on duty. Thank you. Uh, I'm not certain what uh, federal law is on other instances, uh -huh. whether it's one or two party, but 38 states, which is well over three-fifths, only require one party. We had a couple. Of, hey, Representative, we um, wow. had a lot of wiretapping. <laughs> yeah, no, it's this is your bill, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> <laughs> a sponsor. We may let him speak today. Representative, have the Senate seat. No, yeah, this is the hot. This is the much no, hot. Thank you. <laughs> Um, a couple things we brought up this year regarding the statute on this bill and other bills uh, was whether, what, what's the difference between public official? Because it started out, another bill started out that we should be able to do audio record, video record police officers. And then it morphed into all public officials. Right. Then there was a question, what's a public official? And people said, okay, that's probably a good idea, but we'll, we'll debate that. And another question was whether you can just record them when they're out in the open. And I think that's what the Glick decision says. And this is what law enforcement is going to use, throw back at your, your kind of people. Say, well, Glick decision only refers to police, not public officials, just police, and when they're out in the open, right? Like in this case, it was in the park in Boston Common. So that's different from a phone call. So these are all um, details we've had a real tough time working on. So next to you, did you want to share with us? Sure. Please introduce uh, yourself and give us some yeah, comments. Uh, yeah, State Representative Robert T. from Berlin. You know, I came down this morning only because I had discussions with some of the seniors. They had senior meals last week because uh, I volunteer there, but they're concerned about regarding this legislation. There is a need to up, you know, to uh, make it, you know, in step or in line with federal law. Um, as far as public officials, I mean, it, it's got to be defined, but I, the seniors were concerned, and I'm concerned as well, that it, it's only when it involves, you know, in their official capacity, you know, if, if you overstep their bounds and then, you know, you know, and try to re eavesdrop on, on their home or during private conversations that has nothing to do with their role as a public official, then I can see it being, you know, unlawful. But there's, there's a fine point there as to whether or not if they're, you know, in... Uh, let's see, out in the public, whether or not that it should be considered eavesdropping. So there's a fine line there. Also, if you look at the, the legislation as presented, I mean, it's, it's got some really good points in it. Uh, try to define it, you know, in general terms because you'll be upgrading the definition of telecommunication all the time. But it seems the bill seems to justify its actions more than legislate. So I was concerned about the language in the, in the bill being extremely verbose. You know, trying to justify what they mean and 
and to avoid, I guess, confusion, you know, in the long run. But I mean, simplify it as the best way you can. And that way, by simplifying the bill, by simplifying the bill, it will make it a lot easier for people to to enforce it instead of adding confusion to it. That's good. Representative, yeah. question for you regarding the seniors you spoke with. Yeah. I'm unclear on what part they're concerned about. Do they think that the current law is too narrow? Uh, yeah, they do. They think that public officials should be more on the record, more transparent, more accountable? Well, no. They, you know, they are accountable. What they're concerned about, if you're going to uh, uh, record something, you know, it needs to be in in the role as you know, a public official, but not as a private citizen in their home. Let's okay. say uh, somebody was trying to record a, a public official at their camp. They were there with their family, not doing anything, you know, for the public. It's their private time. So why do they need to be eavesdropped or harassed, is the term I'd like to use, when they're trying to enjoy themselves with their family, had nothing to do with their role as a public official. But if they're on a job, yes. on a job, on a record. No problem there whatsoever. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, when you brought that up, you were doing senior meals. Yes. Were they concerned that because you were an official, conversations that you would be having with them may be recorded? They had no problem whatsoever with that at, at all. I mean, I was having, I was performing. You know, they asked me as a public official, you know, and to to get the feedback, you know, that they wanted to convey to you. I had no problem. You know, I had nothing to hide because I was acting as a, you know, my role as a public official. Okay. Thank you for sharing. I'll introduce Representative Olivier. He's the sponsor, prime sponsor on this bill, and maybe you can fill in the crowd and the, the subcommittee on the original intent behind this, uh, assuming it's more than just to update the statute to current technology. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Representative Gordon Ellery. Um, part of the intent was to update the statute. A careful reading of the statute would make everything that WMUR broadcasts from a sporting event a felony um, under current law. Now that's just plain wrong. The idea generally was events in public are in public. There's no expectation of privacy in public. However, there are some things that we have in our law that are very good, such as the enhanced listening devices. However, that also means that every time a hunter goes out into the woods and uses a, a device to listen for deer, He's committing a crime, <laughs> even though he's <laughs> doing what is normally done. Uh, the Audubon Society, when they're out listening for bird calls, are committing a crime under the way the statute is currently worded. Mm. It needs to be updated, I believe. And that is something that we need to look at. Uh, some of the language would favor law enforcement, which is true. But at the same time, some of that f uh, favoring law enforcement is a good idea. The case that comes up is the one that took place in Washington, D.C., where two women who were employees of the FBI went out for coffee. They were in an outside cafe, and they overheard a conversation that was taking place at the table next to them while they were planning the crime. So they turned on a tape recorder. Now in D.C., it's a one-party state, or one-party entity, so they can go ahead and report it. It prevented a crime from taking place and potential harm to individuals. I have a question. In a moment, sir. The entire purpose of this legislation was uh, being introduced, was to bring it before the House, before the General Court, to determine how we can upgrade our statutes and Granted, it, it was a, a large bill. Mm -hmm. There are areas that need to be upgraded, and we need to take a look at them. Uh, and in doing so, it's now here before the subcommittee, and I am sure that we'll come up with something that works to upgrade this uh, very old statute, in law terms, very old statute. 
There are good things in New Hampshire's law. New Hampshire is a two-party state. It's one of the very few two-party states. Can you uh, remind us in the difference? What's the two-party versus one-party? What does that it mean? Prim it primarily applies to t uh, recording telephone conversations, where uh, one, although it can also be involving with the tape recorder, where one party has to give consent for the conversation to be recorded. Uh, and presumably, in Hampshire, if you, if both parties have to. As a matter of fact, if you, uh, uh, the police departments, uh, uh, there was uh, some litigation that was involved in that, and you now have uh, a statement if you're calling into a police department, oh, by the way, we're recording this conversation. Uh, it's now routine uh, behavior for that. Uh, there was some litigation that actually outlawed uh, home answering machines. <laughs> And that had to be addressed. Technology has advanced faster than the law has in this case. Mm. And in that instance, we need to address the issues. Um, very likely, um, you know, when we're in here, it's public. What we say in here should be recorded. It should be done. But if I walk up to you and whisper in your ear, that, I have an expectation that the conversation is between you and I. And, and if the individual recording is using a um, uh, shotgun mic to zoom in on that, yeah, I have a problem with that. Well, let me ask you this. That would, could easily be considered eavesdropping. Yeah. But if you and I are speaking and you're, we're whispering, but I'm recording it, am I allowed to do that? Not under current law. Not without asking him. Not without uh, asking him. Which is why this guy got uh, convicted of felonies. Now, it's presumed that when we walk in here that what we say is going to be reported. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the cameraman here did not ask permission of every single individual, although it's obvious that he's recording because he's using a device. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, a strict construction of our current law actually outlaws the sale of those devices. <laughs> it's kind of stupid. I think, uh, oh, if you don't mind entertaining a question, I think, Bill, is it you that had a question as a sponsor? Will you first? Mm -hmm. uh, just in, uh, I'll keep it very confined because you were speaking about uh, an exception for law enforcement and how these ladies in D.C. were able to prevent a crime. But any citizen could have and should have been able to do the exact same thing. So again, no exception for law enforcement is necessary unless you're saying that a citizen in the exact same situation should not have been able to prevent that crime. No, that's not what I'm saying. Okay. I was just uh, being used as an example of how the, the difference between a one-party and two-party state. So Thank you. now you guys are seeing what some of the problem is. We seems There was consensus in the committee that there's a problem, but working out the solution is very, very difficult. President Welch? I had a call <clears throat> during the session last year that uh, Fellow got, he was threatened over the phone. It happened to be by a public official. He recorded it. He put it on the internet. And, and through a series of events, he's now sitting in, in uh, state prison. And I think that if somebody is recording a threat, there ought to be an exception for that. Should be. You shouldn't have to say, well, could you say that again while I turn on my recorder? <laughs> it's not going to happen. But uh, uh, that is a very serious thing. The problem with that is, right. though, you don't know in advance that it's going to be a Well, threat. no, you don't. But oh. the whole thing is that he had been threatened by <coughs> before. He was ready the second time it happened, and he recorded it. I think you ought to be able to record any conversation you're having with another person. So, that's, that's, that's one part of consent. Your part, your part of to the uh, communication, you're obviously giving consent. That would require a major change yeah. in, in, the, in the statute of New Hampshire, which is actually the solution to what Representative Walsh's uh, mm -hmm. the situation developed. I, I feel for the gentleman, uh, we've had this conversation, um, he violated the other person's privacy. Uh, a good example of privacy interfering with public safety is what took place in, in Exeter uh, with, the, uh, with the hepatitis C outbreak. Yeah. Uh, having done employee background investigations, 
you call up somebody and say, hey, do you know so-and-so, did he work there? Yes, he did. Well, what kind of employee was he? It's none of your business. <laughs> <laughs> he worked for us from June to July. Mm -hmm. Which is he, and if you even ask the question, is he eligible for rehire? I'm sorry, I can't give you that right. information. Which is, this, you know, yes, I value my privacy. Everyone in here values their privacy. But privacy is in your, in your house. It's not when you're holding yourself out to the public. And there right. needs to be a, a distinction. A distinct, thank you for the word. Yeah, you're welcome. Rips. Dale, we're going to go sort of in serpentine fashion. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, just a quick comment, and I, and I think it might help clarify the issue. Is using the word intent, the intention of the individual was not to record for the purposes of following, you know, you know, you know that that thread. Also, the, the intent of the hunter listening for deer, and then happens to zoom around and hears two two officials. You know, eavesdropping. I mean, his intent wasn't to eavesdrop. So, if you clarify the law by using the word, the intent of the individual was to, you know, might might help the situation a bit. I mean, that's just my comment. Isn't doesn't that play to the section of law called was it mens rea? Mens rea. Yeah, mens rea. Right. Where there's the yeah. I mean, you think about it, you want it to be bad. There was intention. Yeah. Yeah. There was no intention to be you know ill or use it for right. ill purposes. It just circumstances. Mm -hmm. yeah. But often we have these laws built so that they can be used against everybody. Um, I'm going to defer this time to Representative because he's another rep in the room, and then we'll continue around with uh, Ian's row. Um, I, you, you, touched on couple, you touched on a couple of issues I haven't heard discussed yet. Um, one is the question of who's a public official. Uh -huh. um, we had uh, an incident happen, um, as you're aware, in court on Monday where uh, a high school principal was on the stand and basically said, No, I'm not a public official, and yet. Um, if she's not, then who else is it? And I think that the clarifying that definition, whether it's coming up with a standard definition that we use everywhere or specifically in this case, needs to be crystal clear. We need to be able to say who is considered to be a public official in the line of duty because at that point there's now an exception. That we, we now know that public officials essentially by taking that position waive their right to privacy at their job. If you go work at a supermarket, no, just because you're there doesn't mean you can be recorded, but when you take a public position, you, you essentially accept as part of that responsibility the public part of that. Well, That's let me ask you, if you're a rep and you're at the grocery store, are you still a public official, or only when you're in the state house, or well? But that's a perfect bags? example. If I'm walking around and I'm shopping in the grocery store, no. But if I run into a constituent and um, they happen to be uh, having a phone and they say, you know, I've got a question for you and I'm going to put it on my blog, I think they have the right to go ahead and record, even if I say, yeah, I really don't want to talk about that right now, because that is a public response. Mm -hmm. um, we're entering into an age of technology, and this is part two of what I was going to say, where Google is coming out with these things called Google Glasses. I mean, the cameras have gotten so small, and the technology has gotten so good that essentially you can live stream to the internet so other people can be seeing exactly what's going on in your day. And if essentially with the, with the two-party system we have, anybody who puts on one of those pair of glasses potentially can be charged with a felony almost immediately. That to me says we have a problem. So <coughs> solution one would be to go to a one party cons uh, consent. So at that point, it's no longer an issue. <laughs> if, if, and I'm not sure what the advantage would be to leaving us as a two party state. Uh, and I'm curious, I'm curious to ask this, the sponsor why his bill didn't just seek to go to a one party state. I was thinking, of, uh, if I might answer, Mr. Chairman. Please, yeah. Um, I'm thinking of one individual who is well known to the representatives in here and the arguments that that person would make. Uh, the, fact the, matter, the fact is, the arguments for a two-party sta uh, state are strong in protecting privacy. However, I think the arguments for a one-party decision are even stronger. And I believe, with the support of other individuals in the House, uh, 
legislation making or converting New Hampshire to a one-party state can be made with a simple argument. If you're receiving a phone call, that other person has intruded into your private space. He's, he's made a call to your house. Well, what I'm doing in my house is what I'm doing. If I don't want the call recorded, I can just tell him that. If he's recording it, a bill collector calling in, for example, don't record it. Turns it off. You can still have the conversation, but it's not recorded. But please, the argument for a two-party state is, I don't have to take an affirmative action, and that's why you, the the two-party state was in there. Personally, I six and one half dozen the other. The simple solution is to make New Hampshire a one-party state. Mm -hmm. the, difficult, the difficult situation is to protect the privacy of all persons involved. And by making New Hampshire a one-party state, <coughs> a lot of the issues are, are, are resolved. But by making it a two-party state, it becomes a passive protection as opposed to an active protection. And mm -hmm. if I may make one further comment, please. The supermarket is a public space. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to uh, um, make a long statement on this, but my inclination is, notwithstanding the seeming popularity of some of the people here for the one-party idea, that privacy is and remains one of our most important, most fundamental values. It has to do with the sovereignty of the individual. And the, the, uh, the uh, two-party rule uh, seriously impinges on the sovereignty of the individual. And uh, so my inclination, I'm not, uh, not, I'm more than uh, uh, not just even-handed on this. Mm -hmm. And I'm not all the way against the idea of two-party consent. But I'm seven to five or eight to four rather than six of one and half a dozen of the other, like my, my friend here, um, for the idea of uh, two-party consent. And I think everybody here has an interest in protecting their own independence <coughs> and sovereignty in this way, and their freedom from uh, being recorded in this way and having their own sovereignty impinged upon in this way without their having been informed and afforded the opportunity to, to uh, resist. Thank you, Representative Welch. Yeah, I think our society has changed an awful lot in the, in the last few years with the, with the technology that has come before us. And I, I get this image of, of people running around with tape recorders and video recorders looking for a reason to make that recording and to use it in some way that just isn't a good, good purpose. And I understand what these folks are, are talking about, but you know, we don't always interact with police officers because most of us obey the laws. We don't have arguments with our neighbors because we don't talk to them anymore. And I think that Ultimately, we're going to become a society of families like this. We're just not going to communicate because it will all be recorded. In fact, the people who use Facebook and all these other social media, they put their whole lives out there, and that's fine if they choose to do that, but they have to be careful because when they go to look for a job, an employer is going to check out their Facebook. And some people are not going to get the jobs that they are otherwise qualified for. I, I just think that this is, we're at the beginning, I think, of uh, some sort of a societal uh, storm of some sort that it, it, hopefully it'll sort itself out at some point. But right now, everybody is so anxious to record somebody or something that's going on because it's new. I just, I, I I don't know how I feel about it exactly, but somewhere there's got to be. Representative Welch, I know Representative Allery has a question, but do you believe people in legislature uh, 
collectively are smart enough to make laws to keep up with technology. I would like to think that. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my feeling is that... Your idea of self-defense is a cannon. He actually owns a cannon, so we have to keep this in mind. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are only four pounders. I mean, <laughs> well, actually, one's a six-pounder. The other one. <laughs> but uh, I sold that one. Oh. But the whole, you know, I think you all understand what I'm getting at is, well, some parts of it are good if it affects you in a positive sense. Mm -hmm. What affects you in a positive sense may affect somebody else in a negative way. And somewhere in the middle is, is for instance, an exception to making a recording of a threat. I think that is a, is a minimum. Because that, that is evidence. And that would certainly put somebody away who needs to go away. Or take them out of their job or something of that nature. But uh, just a, a blanket approach. I don't know if I'm ready for that. But just to quickly respond to that, Mark, I think it's our job to try to keep up with technology. We, we can succeed. You're right. But, uh, but we need to make the effort. Uh, Google write the statute for us. Yes, the all powerful. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the, the question I have of the representatives here is, in your mind, I'm speaking, you're hearing. The cameraman a moment ago was making a note. What is the difference between hearing, making a note, and recording? That's a very good point. That's a good point. There is no difference. If I, what I say, you know, I, I, you, you've heard of the, the, a comment regarding personal habits. If you don't any, want anyone to see you scratching a part of your body, don't scratch it in public. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I, um, again, we're going kind of loosey goosey today. It's informal. Let's try to hear some comments because you guys have come a long way. We're to people's house. Typically, in a subcommittee, we don't even take public testimony. Um, but we're going a little bit uh, more liberal today. So but I am. You and you're a liberal? <laughs> Classical. Wait, cut that tape. That would be, <laughs> <how it's laughs> that would be the whole commercial. Republican <laughs> <laughs> Swiffer says to Republican Ward, you're a liberal? <laughs> you said you were being more liberal today. <laughs> But we don't have an expectation of privacy there. <laughs> I'm Joe Harris. I'm an intern with the governor's office. I'm just taking notes. For mm -hmm. Does he have a position on this? I'm not qualified to speak on that. OK, since you're here, thanks for being here. Sure. You might note that it was thrown out there, suggested by somebody, that maybe the governor could look at pardoning the guy who was convicted of this felony on Monday. Why would he do that? He has no political, no political um, benefit to it, but it might be a good thing to do. It might be the right thing to do. It might be the right thing to do. Mr. Freeman? Yeah, I'm Ian Freeman. I host a talk program on over 100 radio stations from coast to coast. So I've got a little bit of experience in, in media and, and all of this. Um, to answer your question about, it was kind of a rhetorical one, but what's the difference between writing something down, remembering something you're told, and having it on video? The difference is the video, or the audio recording is objective. So if uh, somebody tells me something, and I have to remember it, I might misremember some of it when I'm telling someone else what I've been told. That can be a problem. Uh, so having an objective record of what was said is, is important, especially when it comes to relaying a threat or something else like that. But you don't need to have exceptions uh, to a really complicated law. I support what, uh, what Mark here has suggested in having the one party uh, consent because one of the things that I think has been misunderstood in some of this discussion is that it's, it's not a violation of your privacy when you tell me something. So if I'm having a conversation with you and you tell me something, it, you no longer have privacy there because you talked about it. So if you want privacy, you have to keep it to yourself. Privacy is something that each individual has to work toward. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes money to retain your privacy. And as soon as you tell someone something, you no longer have an expectation that that person, that that person has no obligation to keep your secret for you. And uh, so th that's, I think, an important thing to, uh, to remember. In, in addition... Ian? Yes. Do 
you mind if you sure. take questions yeah. specifically on that point? If you were alive in the 1700s, would you have been uh, hanging around outside Independence Hall when they had their secret meetings? I'm not sure I understand what. Well, what you when, when they when they wrote the Constitution, there was they did it in secret mm -hmm. because they wanted the freedom to talk amongst themselves and say things that perhaps could ruin their reputations outside. Um, so, if I'm understanding your question, is your question would I be eavesdropping on their secret well, conversations? No, I guess what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to remind everybody here is that there are times when privacy is not only an expectation but also very necessary. We would never have had the Constitution that gives us the freedom we have today if it had been done in public. Well, I see where you're coming from. The original intention of uh, wiretapping statutes like this was to protect conversations uh, of which you are not a party. So if you were having a private conversation with a gentleman next to you on the phone and I were to somehow breach that conversation with some technological means perhaps by wire tapping, mm -hmm. running my own wire onto yours without your knowledge, that was the original intention of this, of this law. But if you're wanting to record your own conversation, you shouldn't have to tell anybody about it because people behave differently when they know they're being recorded. So, right. So, <clears throat> so for instance, with the, the, the guy who just got convicted of felonies, uh, when he was on the phone with a police officer, that officer was very rude to him. He hung up the phone on him. And that officer might not have behaved in such a rude manner had he known that he was being recorded. He actually so, testified that he would have behaved the same way. He claimed that, but I don't believe that's true. Yeah. And there's well, evidence to... exercising his right to not talk to him by hanging up. So either way, it's a good solution if it's one party. Right. And there's another important point. Again, being a member of the media, I come from uh, Florida originally. And down there, there are always these reports on television by, like, you know, News Channel 8. Channel 8's on your side. We went into this car dealership where their, you know, our list, you know, viewers told us they were getting ripped off. And we've got hidden cameras that we went in there with, and we've asked them these questions. And they get evidence of businesses behaving badly. In the same way, we have gotten evidence of politicians and other government bureaucrats behaving badly because they didn't know they were being recorded. So the same thing with these businesses. It's completely illegal in New Hampshire for me to go into a car dealership with a hidden camera and run one of those sort of sting operations on them. So not only are politicians and bad cops being protected, but also bad businessmen are being protected from uh, being investigated here because this is a two, so-called two-party consent state. So again, the, uh, the one-party consent situation would solve all of these problems. You don't need to be writing a complicated law with a bunch of exceptions. Of course, the one exception is today we have the technology to do all these things, and back then they did. That's a good answer, by the yeah. way. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a question for Ian? Uh, yeah. For point, for point. I have um, another life outside of this building. I'm an overseer of public welfare, and that's a confidential department. And what you're saying is that I can record my clients and not tell them, or they can record me without telling me? Well, if it's your job to, uh, if it's part of your job to keep things confidential, then you'd be violating your, your terms of agreement for your job in that case. But if they were to be recording, they're probably not under the same uh, agreement that you are. So yeah, absolutely. You should, if, if somebody else is on the other end of the line and they want to record the phone call that they're on, then they shouldn't have to tell you anything. You should be behaving in the best manner possible all the time, whether or not you know you're being recorded. And if you're not behaving in a positive manner, in a helpful manner, then you deserve to be outed for that, don't you think? Yes. Um, well, my clients, I only see them face-to-face. -face. I don't speak on the phone. Whether it's face-to-face yeah. -face or on the phone, again, I can have, uh, it was mentioned by Seth here that uh, recording devices are getting very small. I could have a recording device in my watch, my sunglasses, and on a necklace uh, around me. If somebody wants to do this sort of undercover investigation, it shouldn't, they shouldn't have to tell anybody that they're being recorded because then all of a sudden they're going to change with their behavior. And we need to know how these government bureaucrats are behaving on a normal basis when they think they're just dealing with just another member of the public who's not recording them, how do they behave? The fact is they're likely to behave rude, they're likely to behave uh, in, a, in an offensive manner, and they need to be outed for that. And it should not be a crime to show this, uh, this sort of thing. You look confused. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
Um, they don't see you? There's some other folks with their hands up. I don't know if they have a... Well, it's, uh, no, no, no. I'm going to try to keep some sort of okay. <clears throat> continuity here. So if, if you're done with your um, comments or finish up, then we'll move so. to Bill. Thank you just on the other check side, here. Um, yep, I think that uh, that's about it. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Bill, would you like to share anything with us? Um, sure, a couple of points. Bill Allman from where? Um, where? Where? <laughs> Southwear or nowhere? But, <laughs> Not nowhere, so where. We're only minutes from nowhere, though. A <laughs> um, couple, of, couple of points. Um, first of all, regarding uh, the law as it stands right now, my reading of it, yes, it is a two-party state um, assuming an expectation of privacy to begin with, but even then, there is a distinction made between uh, essentially two party and one party. It's the difference between a felony and a misdemeanor. If you are a party to the conversation, it's a misdemeanor. If one party has agreed in advance, it is a misdemeanor. Except that that's not what the courts are holding. Exactly my point. Exactly, right. exactly my point. The executive branch and um, their operatives in uniform conveniently choose to ignore the distinction. And what happened this week was a miscarriage of justice, and that is why Lynch should pardon. Yes. The, uh, Please. My other point is that there is no right for employees to hide from their employers when they're on the clock. And in fact, the New Hampshire Constitution expressly states that with regard to government employees, in part first, Article 8, at all times accountable. They can't hide. And it doesn't matter that a public school principal claims that she's not a public employee. She is paid by stolen tax dollars. She works for the people, and she's accountable for them at all times. Um, and I guess that's it. Well, okay, thank you. Will you Representative Delanus? Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Um, I, actually, of course, what was on my mind has been spoken by the last two speakers, and I agree with that. You're one of those constitutionalists, aren't you? I am one of those constitutionalists, and, I, and, and, you have no and business I'm not in the free state. <laughs> come from this state. Uh, I'm... I'm of the opinion that you always have to behave. I, when, I, my, when my plates are on my car and I'm driving down the road, if I cut somebody off, I am an official cutting somebody off. You know, I mean, no matter where we are, people see me at the grocery store, as Seth, you brought that up. I had a gentleman come and look at my plates and my bumper stickers and said, uh, are you one of my representatives? If I was in a shoe store looking for a pair of sandals. Yes, we had a conversation. I am always a public official. When the phone rings, it doesn't matter who I'm speaking with. My best friends can come over to my house and we might have a beer together, but I'm still her representative it, it, on, on a level. I've been hired by the people, and that doesn't end for me, ever. That's always how I stand. I think all public officials, all public officials should be held accountable at all times and should, should walk the walk and not just talk the talk of being a servant of the people. And I don't care what capacity or whether you're a principal in a school or whatever, you know, if you are in, you know you're in that capacity. I'm not a, I'm not a representative and guessing whether or not, oh, gee, that means I'm accountable to the public? Of course. You know you are. It's, it's really, it shouldn't even have to be said. But apparently, we need to, we need to clarify to the point of ridiculousness so that everybody understands clearly what we should expect. So I, I also believe that the single uh, person part of this is, is essential, really. Okay, good, thank you. I, I want to sort of emphasize and reiterate some things that have already said, such as taking long. Ian called it objective. The difference is that whenever you're having a conversation with someone, it's being recorded. 
it's in my mind. Uh, it's in my recollection. I might be writing it down if I'm on the phone with Mark as my representative, for instance. I could be writing down what he's saying, and I could quote him later and say, I was on the phone with Mark Warden, and he said this very blasphemous thing, and I could try to quote exactly what he said, but I'm just doing it to the best of my recollection. What modern technology is doing is making sure that that's an accurate recollection. And then he, if he has a beef with that, if he says no, you, uh, if he sees my recording and says that, that you edited out something that I said, he can record all of his conversations on his site and release the full recording to protect himself if he wants. In, in a one-party uh, state, if we, were, if we had a one-party rule that if you're a party to the conversation, you are recording the conversation. The question is, are you recording it accurately and objectively, like Ian said? And modern technology should be a way of us to protecting ourselves and saying, Mark said, Dale misquoted me. And he could have a, rep he could have a recording of that phone call to to have evidence that I misquoted him. And, and I may have uh, tried to claim that he made a racist remark. And he could play verbatim uh, that conversation back to protect himself and his own reputation to say that I misquoted him and I said it wrongly. Modern technology, if we use it right, can be a tool to protect ourselves and uh, our rights. And, uh, and, and again, and in a one party rule, we could, we could both be recording the conversation and getting an accurate, objective, Representation of, representation of exactly what was said. And in the case, for instance, when you talked about the Constitution being written and how important it was that they had privacy in that building, I bet you everyone in that room vetted every other person in that room to some extent because there's trust there. Yep. That every one of them knows what's going on in that room and any one of them could go out and tell other people what happened inside that room. So they had an agreement with them between each other that this was going to be a private conversation until they completed that document. And uh, in the case of when she says she has uh, confidential information, information, and her, uh, she's a public, uh, uh, she works in a public capacity for her customers who expect privacy from her in that capacity. She has a responsibility to them in that capacity to protect their privacy, but they have no obligation to her. Uh, she's a public official, and uh, they should be able to record that. She should have no expectation. If she records the conversation, she's, she's uh, violating what she agreed to in her public capacity. But, uh, but there's, uh, again, holding, holding her accountable as a servant to the public is something that is, is an important right to have for the sake of accountability. So uh, these cases, that's the whole point of a one-party rule. Uh, that the, the Constitution being written in that building, they closed all the doors, they didn't let anyone in, they probably shut, shuttered everything, all the windows, and they vetted each other because they only had an agreement with each other not to share that conversation outside of that. The conversation was being recorded. Uh, people were taking notes. People were memorizing things. Modern technology just means it's going to be a more accurate recording. Thank you, Dale. The sponsor had a point on that. Are you suggesting then that a one-party rule provides more privacy protections than a two-party rule does to the individual? Yes. Uh, it's it 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 provides better protection. Period. In the sense that. If I, uh, the conversation is being recorded regardless. It just might be an inaccurate recording. It might be my memory. It might be me taking notes of what you said. And I could come out and say that you told me this in a conversation. I could be telling the truth. But you could deny that and say, no, he lied about that. Or he didn't represent it accurately. Or my memory could just be bad. But if I'm recording the conversation, I have an accurate, uh, more objective recording of the facts of what we said. Uh, and and if, I, if, I, if I were to misstate what you said, for instance, um, I, uh, the, the difference if I play back what you said in your own voice, that's an accurate representation. And if you're concerned that I'm going to misquote you, you can record your phone calls too. And, 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 and for instance, if I tried to edit out a portion of what you said to make it sound out of context and make it inaccurate, you could correct that by, by this is the actual recording unedited and, and show how I had misrepresented you. So, so it would protect your rights and your reputation. So if I was a public official, or even a private official, or a business official, with the one-party rule, there would be a greater degree of protection, both to the individual and to the other entity as well. Right. Uh, like, like Ian mentioned, the uh, hidden cameras that catch business owners engaged in really shifty practices. Uh, the business owner could, should be able to have their own cameras on the scene too, and maybe they show something that most in context and full cameras. Yeah, yeah, and mostly yeah. do well, in full context. It might totally change the interpretation. But I'm of those you yeah, I, I think I'm going to answer point. that question to you, Carla Garrett from Manchester. Um, there are exceptions in the wiretapping rules, specifically for law enforcement officers, to give them uh, one-party consent. 
So the question would be, why do they need that? Because they obviously feel that that is protecting their rights more. So I think to the individual, if we had one party consent, that would just make it fair for everyone. Otherwise, my suggestion would be there should be no exceptions. Either it's two party for everyone, or it's one party for everyone. Right. If I might ask, please, Colin. Now, what's the percentage now? I must say there are a lot of good arguments here, and 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 I think the predominant feeling here seems to be a suspicion of public officials in general and a dislike for public officials. I don't think that's a dislike. Uh, it's accountability. Or where, let's say wariness, and accountability is a nice way of saying it, um, and, and, and uh, openness and so on. And, and I must say that in many instances I share that wariness, not suspicion, but wariness and the desire for accountability. I think it's quite reasonable to expect that. And there are ways in which it could be improved and enforced. And so I think you have to take that category, though, of public officials, set it aside. Um, because not everything here that we've talked about in the past and that we're talking about now has to do with public officials. And uh, my concern for uh, issues of privacy has not to do with public officials acting in their public capacity, where I think uh, certain kinds of exceptions, the kinds of things you're talking about, certainly do apply. And I understand that's your perspective because you're working in that kind of a context in that business. But for private individuals, it's quite a different matter. Private conversations, conversations between two people or more, in their circumstances where either one of them expects privacy and does not expect to be recorded, uh, need to be protected. And the reason is there is a difference between a conversation that is recorded and one that is not. Because the one that is recorded, the conversation itself, can go well beyond the intention of the people in the conversation in its circulation. And that has consequences of all kinds, and we've talked about those, many different ones of those. And so that uh, justifies, and in fact, in my opinion, requires a quite different standard uh, for what can be recorded and what cannot. Good, thank you. We're going to give everybody a chance to speak around the room, but did you have something specific to this? Yeah. Conversation, please. Um, I, my name is Teresa. I'm from Hanneker. I'm not in the media. I'm just a citizen who just moved to New Hampshire um, in October. And I've already had a situation where something was being recorded um, by some people who were watching a traffic stop where I had gotten pulled over. And the police officer got so angry, and it escalated to the point where I ended up having an arrest warrant issued. And it was really bizarre because I'd gotten pulled over for not having a, a proper inspection sticker in my on my car window, and so I was expecting a ticket for that. What I, what ended up happening was something completely different, and is and and quite honestly changed the way I feel about this recording. There is a true lack of accountability and transparency in the way we're being governed, in the way that we're being treated. There's an expectation on our end that if we go into a store, we're being recorded. When I was at a, D a demos trial, there, there, the teacher was, ta the principal was talking about the fact that the students are recorded. The police station was talking about the fact that phone calls are being recorded. That they have what they, all the ways that we're being recorded every single day. I do not understand why there is not the same expectation of those people to whose, whose salaries we're paying, whether they're elected officials or appointed officials through interview processes or something else. The fact of the matter is, this entire thing happened. He would, he, he is in jail because he pointed out that a police officer slammed a 17-year-old's face into a table. I have two kids. I want somebody like that doing that. I want that person to be able to do that, and I want to be able to know that that happened, and I want that person to be able to call up the principal and say, why is this happening? What are you doing to stop it? Instead, he's in jail. The principal's saying the safety was maintained, and this officer still has his job, but that 17-year-old still got his face slammed into a, a, a table, and this guy's spending a couple months in jail, possibly years if he's not good. There's a problem with the way things are being yeah, done. I agree. Thank you, Teresa. And to your point, uh, Phil, the problem is that if you just ask somebody, what is the meaning to you of wiretapping, they'll tell you. you know, listening to somebody's private phone conversation, you're a third party, and you're, you haven't been invited, you don't know them, and you're cheating. It should be illegal. Like, is it? Walk like a duck, walk like a duck, is it a duck? That's what wiretapping should be. 
but it's been over the years uh, misconstrued and misused, in my opinion. Uh, it used to be protect people, private citizens, from other private citizens who want to do ill. But now this law has been ma mainly used by government in the recent in recent history. That's where we've seen the most uh, examples used by government against private citizens who are simply trying to hold government accountable. Yep. Can that, I that's a problem. Can I well, I, and, 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 and I do agree with you about this need to hold people accountable. I, any new law, and this goes to your question about um, responding to technology, should not include the word wiretapping, right? That, that word is useless now, virtually. Uh, okay, yeah. No. What Mark was getting at is, is one of the reasons, if you read the current wiretap statute, it talks about physical wiretapping. Right. Mm. But it's been expanded by the courts, by the presumed intent of the law, and by the inaction of the legislature in countering this expansion. Uh, I hate to say it, but a couple of your colleagues, shall we say where, shall we say Nashua, have taken this just a bit too far uh, in invasion of individuals' rights. Within my house, I think I have a right to do pretty much what I want. And if, I'm having, and if a cop is in the house and he's record, and I record the conversation, that's fine, because it's in my house. Out in the public, same thing. But, Representative, it's not, because we have a case down in Nashua. Sure. Yeah, 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 that's, the, that's the problem. Yeah, no, that's more part of the impetus here. Now, at the same time, I don't want to handcuff the police so that they can't do common sense types of activities engaged in either investigating a crime that has occurred or undercovering intelligence of a crime that is likely to occur. One party consent solves that problem. And they should still have a warrant if they're going to wiretap somebody's recording. If, if they're, if they're going to for that kind of Now that, that comes into the area of what is uh, open and public and what is surreptitious and hidden. I'm going to break into your house and stick a bug underneath your your office, actually, or and stick a bug in that in that. Uh, structure where there is an expectation of privacy, damn well better have a warrant, mm -hmm. have an articulable uh, suspicion of an, of an action and as to why this particular thing is necessary to do this specific type of activity. And I don't think you have any objection to that. Mm -hmm. You do it all the time anyway. In fact, let's, let's kind of move on because we won't want to be here all day <laughs> and I ask people to sort of limit your comments to something new, but we certainly want to hear from uh, some people from law enforcement here. But Michael, you're next. I'll pass. You'll pass. How about yeah. you? Brendan Perry, and um, I'm here on behalf of my client, which is TAA, the Technology Association of America. Mm -hmm. And we're just, um, we're more on the, the whole different area, which is the technological end of things and just listening. Um, it's, it's peripheral. We don't really have an opinion one way or the other on the discussion that's gone on um, in specific of people's rights. But we do have certain clients or members within the association that either have the equipment um, or in the line of uh, the security industry. So um, this is an interesting discussion and um, we're obviously in the technology end of things. So you'd agree that Google and Facebook should help us write the law? <laughs> <laughs> it's good for business. So okay. it's, it's, <laughs> Thank you for being here, Alex. Thanks. Please, Chief. Uh, Chief Goldstein, uh, Franklin Police Department. I'm representing the Chiefs Association. I'm here more to observe and report than anything else. Today. Um, can you fill in the subcommittee on what sort of announcement or directive you got from the Attorney General's office, the uh, patrol units and police departments got from the Attorney General's office after the Glick decision? When did that come down? And just paraphrase what it said. Basic, in regards to traffic stops and such. Basically, we no, thank you. Basically, <laughs> we um, we understand the realities of what happens in public, and yes, uh, to be recorded is fine. Um, there are always going to be very specific instances where we might be in public where we would 
object to recording. If this woman's children were abused and I was talking to them in public, I don't think that she would like this gentleman looking at us with a video camera while I'm asking them what part of their body they were touched. So these are things that go on in public with public officials. If I were abusing my kids or my kids, I'm not saying you, ma'am. I'm, I'm not saying you. I'm saying these are some of the things that we do. Now, a regular old traffic stop, I have no problem. And I think that many of my colleagues are just as open to that as anybody else because we do <coughs> practice transparency and accountability. At least since glycosis. You know, <laughs> many of us before the Glick decision. Oh, oh really? And, and I yes. feel that sure the, Glick, the, the Glick decision yes. was also predicated on other I issues besides just I being recorded. So. There were issues of the officers trying to uh, absolve themselves of certain responsibilities that they did not meet. Uh, so I'm familiar with the Glick decision as well. But I think that right now the points have been brought up that there's, there are definitional issues here. That have to be um, right. that have to be addressed. You are not going to uh, come into the police department necessarily, or any police department, and be allowed total and free access to that department. Uh, whereas it's a public building, there are certain parts of it that are public, and certain parts that are very, very private. Uh, I'm not going to necessarily ed allow you to record in my office uh, unrestrained, so to speak. If the media comes to my office and says we'd like to conduct an interview, that's one thing. But if I'm talking to somebody, a member of the public or something in my office, that's part of a very secure, recognized secure area, a private area, mm -hmm. even though I'm a public official conducting business. So there are definite, I think mostly what I hear are definitional issues. The other thing that I've heard a lot about is this eavesdropping. We don't do that. And I, I can take you back 30 years. And when we do a, a wiretap, for example, we're under something known as the Mincy Rule. And the Mincy Rule is that if we're listening to someone with a court order, with a, with a warrant, essentially, conducting a wiretap, if that conversation does not pertain to what we're there for, we have to minimize our listening capabilities. We have to turn off the report. So I can remember when I was undercover doing many, many uh, listening to wiretaps and so on and so forth. And, and what we were all, we all had to go through the training, even though we've been through it many times before prior to every wiretap. This is the Mincy rule. If they start talking about uh, recipes for apple pie, uh, unless that uh, refers to whatever the drug was, we had to minimize that recording. I have a couple questions about your department. Do you guys have security cameras? inside the hallways and inside yes, the offices? Yes. Do they Work. audio record as well as video no, record? No, just video. Just video. Okay. For people who don't know, this is only about audio recording. That's all we're talking about today. Also, second question, when people call the Franklin PD, uh, are those calls recorded? Yes, only and on the public line. Public line. Somebody calls in, looks up the number of the yellow pages, whatever they do these days, Google, they call that number, it's recorded. Is there an out? Is there a message that again says your call may be recorded? No, because the courts have also informed us that there's a reasonable expectation of people being recorded when they call it a police department on a public line. Oh, did you get that on film? Interesting. So people call Franklin Police Department, they, because it's a public place of public officials, they have a reasonable expectation that their call could be recorded. Yes. So they're not, they're not, they're not they're told. told. They're they must have a contract. And that's just at Franklin, though. Do you think it, that would apply at other PDs? I, I don't, I won't answer for other police departments. I know some have messages, some have a beep in the background that's an old style of, of letting you know that it's being recorded. Um, we're just functioning under, under what we've done, <coughs> and it's right now it's been upheld. Oh. So would you? So you believe that if you're talking to so one of the people from Franklin calls in, I mean that's sort of a public conversation, right? If he calls you on the public line, correct? Not your personal cell, but on, on a police phone, that's okay. Correct. Okay. Interesting. It is a public line, yeah. but not the reverse. Okay. 
Um, Ian, do you have a question specific to this? Uh, Just a point of clarification on about? something that he said about public buildings and kind of the idea that uh, recording could go on there. I don't know if the chief is aware of this, but there are certain public buildings where uh, video camera use is completely prohibited, as well as all audio recording devices. They include all district and uh, superior courts within the state. If I walk into a superior court with a video camera, I will likely be threatened and possibly uh, arrested. So it would seem to me that if uh, public officials are subject to being recorded, that that should apply in any public building in which anyone can walk into. Not necessarily behind a locked door. Obviously, if I can't go through a door that's locked, then that makes sense. Well, we're lucky the chief's in a unique position, because not only is the chief, but he's also a member of the, he's the head of the association. So no, I just not. serve on the executive board. The executive board of the association. So you know what other chiefs do in different areas. So what do you think about that? Well, first of all, you're talking about the courts. Yeah, that's right. I don't answer for the courts. I didn't think you would answer. I just wanted to let you know that uh, recording is completely prohibited in, unless, inside these court, courthouse lobbies, which I think is judge, outrageous. Unless the judge permits it. Uh, okay. I think even on. court employees should be held accountable too. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's a, outside my outside. Yeah, I see. <laughs> uh, the court judge—that's his domain. Yes. He makes the rules. Yes. We may not like them sometimes, but though he makes the rules. If he wants cameras in, he lets them in. If he doesn't, he don't. Point of clarification: but We're talking about the court lobby, not the courtroom. If the jury is going to pass through that lobby, you can't have a camera there. Well, I can have a camera outside. I can record the jurors there. Or coming out the exit door when they're down there. It's, it's jurors are supposed to be, in, have an, be anonymous. Right now, the, the, ju the, the, oh, judges, right. the judges are God in their courtrooms, but yeah. unfortunately, there are buildings where it's not just the court in that building. There are other town right? Um, That's part of the problem. Just, just one man. Yes, please. Number one, the jurors are your peers. So they're equals. They are public, uh, but the solution to the, uh, the question that uh, Ian brings up is very simple: public space of public buildings, not the private space of public buildings. Because if you say all public buildings, then you go into the ladies' room with a camera. And that's Once you go through that screening device, you are in a courthouse. Yeah, and that's that's another question entirely as to where that screening device should be, because the law says in court. Room, not court house. All right. Well, let's let's keep moving on. Uh, Chief, did you want to add anything else to this? No, thank Glad you. Glad you're here. No, appreciate, appreciate that. You. You're a familiar face in our committee. Um, please. Hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Benjamin Agati. I'm an assistant attorney general with the attorney general's office. Uh, I'll be glad to take any questions from representatives if they do have some. But just um, our, my purpose here today is also uh, to observe and also to uh, again hopefully kind of address some of the issues uh, that the the representative sponsored in these particular languages is, is correct. This law was originally put in place a long time ago. It was put there as a protective measure uh, against new technologies that were coming out. Now, some exceptions came for when that technology could or could not be used. Since then, technology has changed to such a standpoint that it causes problems uh, not only under the two-party system that we presently have, causes problems for law enforcement and for the public. So I believe your original question for us was uh, whether what our thoughts were on this particular law, House Bill 553. Uh, and with that, the Attorney General's Office does agree that it is an attempt to try to fix the law as it stands. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to comment generally about whether a two-party or a one-party system. I think that's something separate uh, for legislatures to decide. But in terms of this particular bill, it is trying to fix a problem that is there for everybody. That's that's good. What's your name again? Yeah, yes, my name is Ben Agati. Agati? Yes, sir. Like Agari, same spelling with one R? A G A T I. No R. Oh, I'm sorry. A G A T I. It spells easier than it sounds. <laughs> you always see the telemarketers when they try to call me. Okay. <laughs> uh, pardon my ignorance, but the same level as Anne Rice. You guys have the same type of job? No, sir. No, sir. She is the deputy attorney general. I am just an assistant attorney general. Anne used to be an assistant. She got kicked upstairs. <laughs> she used to be an assistant. Then she was the associate. Call you all. She's now the deputy. She's now the deputy. I work uh, in the criminal justice field. I do primarily homicides and public integrity matters. I also teach at the law, at the uh, police standards and training for the full-time academy, the law package that they have. And I can tell you at least with regards to this question of what's been represented from Glick, 
I can tell you for all of my classes that I have taught, when I have taught this particular statute for the last two and a half years that I've been teaching, I've been telling all of these officers that if they are in public and they're doing a traffic stop and the person is not physically interfering with them and obstructing how they are trying to conduct their traffic stop, then yes, if there's somebody there with a camera on the other side of the road in a public space or a private space where they have a right to be, you are going to be recorded, and there's nothing you can do about it. So you've been it. telling your people at the academy that for two and a half years? I can tell you for at least the two and a half years that I have been teaching there, when it comes time for teaching the wiretapping statute, uh, I have been instructing cadets that no public taping of their, of their actions while they're doing a traffic stop, which is typically the question that I get from them. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as it is not interfering with their ability to conduct their investigation, that it is something that is lawful and is not a violation of the statute. That's so we've so been long teaching before that. the Glick decision, you've been talking about that. And I can't tell you about the previous uh, instructors that may have been there prior to me. I can only tell you right. what I have. No, I understand. Uh, but I can tell you for, for that time period, we have been talking about that. And so the crowd knows that this committee has always been sensitive to video recorders not getting in the way of the police. Right? We always make sure that's covered, that they're not interfering with their police. I can tell you of an example that I've gotten from a cadet recently uh, who asked me while he was with his field training officer, he was conducting a traffic stop. There was an individual on the opposite side of the street uh, moving up and down the street videotaping the stop. Uh, he went over there and said, is there some sort of problems or anything going on? And apparently it was related, no, I'm just taping it. He asked me, was that we didn't do anything, should we have done something under the statute? And my answer was no. Uh, no, you should not have done anything. It's, we have been, at least for the two and a half years, we've been instructing our new cadets going through the full-time academy uh, to be in compliance with Glick before Glick was even around. Right. Okay. Thank you. Have a question for him about that? Yes, sir. Yeah. However, had that gentleman on the opposite side of the street used an amplifying mic, he would have been technically in violation of 553 because he was using an enhanced audio recording device. That would be something that we'd be looking at. Obviously, I'd have to know a lot more about the particular facts of the device, how it's being used. Um, but that is one of the reasons, I think, why uh, this suggested change has been made to the statute to better clarify, because a device like that was not contemplated when the statute was originally enacted. No. It, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there is within the statute a section that says not otherwise able to be heard regarding to that. So that if the two cops, two people on the mm -hmm. other side of the street were shouting and screaming and making a loud noise that could be heard by a pit mic pickup of a commercially available, which I think is the language in here, commercially available device. Uh, there, that, then that section about enhanced doesn't apply. Right. Well, the, the, yeah. real, the real question there comes down to whether or not there is any sort of expectation of privacy. And that the court typically will view that, in my limited experience, as both an objective and a subjective standard. Um, whether or not those individuals would have believed uh, that they could have been possibly intercepted. And whether to a reasonable person, as we all stand around and look at them, whether that belief is reasonable. So the court usually, typically uses a subjective and an objective standard to make that determination. Yeah, I like the, I like the phraseology. I'm a good good person. That's something that should be reasonable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we got to keep moving on. Yes, sir. Thank you, Ben. Another friendly, familiar face to this committee. Hi, I'm Representative. I'm Beth Sargent. I'm here with the chief representing the association. Um, happy to work with the committee and are you his boss? Or <laughs> no, I don't think uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> wow. No, but we certainly want to participate with the committee. Tom Preso with the Mers and Blaisdell just have a number of clients interested in this and we're uh, just observing and I'll report back to them. Thank you. All right, now if you guys want to uh, have a short comment, please keep it very short. Again, we don't want to re repeat things that have been said, but we want to give uh, you guys a chance to talk most, if you can, specifically about the bill, which is updating the language to represent technology, because uh, this is the people's house we want to hear from you. So, Charlie, start with you. No? Yeah. Please. Ident identify yourself and yeah, uh, speak to the bill. My name's Oz. I live in Manchester and don't have any other fancy titles or anything. Um, just a guy. Um, 
Uh, I just wanted to address a question keeps coming up. Um, is it Elaine? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, Elaine brought it up. I, I've heard it, it brought up at the trial on Monday. It's been brought up other places about confidentiality. About what if I'm having a conversation with, with a rape victim? What if I'm having to be a conversation about, with finances? What if I, there's various things that we keep confidential. Confidentiality is not affected by recording that conversation. Confidentiality is affected by sharing that conversation. Confidentiality is not an issue in, in wiretapping as far as first party or as far as one party or two parties is concerned. Because if we have a conversation that has been said, I'm recording it in my mind already. If you tell me about some crisis that's happened in your life, I know about it. If I record that on audio or video or whatever other type of recording I could do, it doesn't breach your confidentiality. If I then go take that and sh share it with somebody else, then I breach your confidentiality. So I don't think I don't think confidentiality is an issue within a wiretapping statute. Because wiretapping has to do with the recording or the interception. The interception is right. The interception of the conversation. That's not a breach of confidentiality. Confidentiality is a separate issue, which I assume is protected under separate laws. I don't know many of the many of the laws, but I would assume that there are other laws there. And so, if we're having a conversation, and it's a, let's, if we're under a one-party state, I don't know if you're recording it or not. But if I say this needs to be kept confidential between us, and you're recording, that's now on the recording. So I have evidence that you violated my confidence <laughs> later, should you do so. Right? This is, uh, okay. yeah, so these I, are all good points we've, we've talked about in committee and they need to okay. be uh, sort of fleshed out in, in writing and crafting language. All right. And, that's, and I, I, I leave the crafting language to the people that craft language. <laughs> but I, it's something that I, haven't, <laughs> that I haven't heard addressed. I keep hearing yes. this. What about this individual? What about this private issue? And the, the, I think it was the chief but, uh, brought up that he's sometimes discussing, uh, for example, with small children who have, been, who have been molested, that he's having this conversation in public so he's kept private. Don't have that conversation in public. Yeah, Don't right. close yeah, the door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and, then, and then, once again, if that child is recording it, or if the police officer is recording it, it's still been kept confidential while the recording is happening. It's still a confidential is only broken when he, when he shares that. That's a good point. That takes us to one way this statute could be improved in the future is to start making it more of a civil uh, crime. Is that the right, or is that, is that the right term? A, a civil issue if people uh, put these conversations out publicly as opposed to being a criminal issue. So thank you all very much. Appreciate it. That's a good, very good point. Hi, uh, my name is William Koster. I've um, testified at a, at a few um, hearings on this before, and thank you, thank you so much. There's, there are so many things that are getting conflated into this law that it, it, it's, <clears throat> it's difficult uh, uh, to, to listen to. So the confidentiality versus the recording was one thing. Another thing is um, when people are talking about private space, you can't just come into my office. Well, no, because that's trespassing. The camera doesn't give you immunity to other laws. So obviously, they can't say, well, gee, I've got freedom of the press and you're a public official, so I'm gonna walk into your private office and stand here and film you. No, because that's only against you know a dozen other laws. Okay. Well, you know, we 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 need we need to make sure that you know it, they they understand that you can't record you know what what if they're this is happening. I guarantee you that's covered under a stalking law. If if, if you're out with your family, okay, camping, and well, I don't want to be recorded then, even though I'm a public official. Yeah, that's called harassment. Okay. They, they, you get a restraining order against those people because they're crazy. That has nothing to do with what we're talking about. These are all extraneous issues that are just like piling on to something that does not need to be an 11-page law. It is not complicated. Reasonable expectation of privacy is, is the watch word. If I am at home and you called me at home and I picked up my phone, you cannot tell me that you have a reasonable expectation of privacy. I can record that phone call. I don't need your consent and I don't need to inform you the way it should be. Okay. Otherwise, what you're doing is, as he said, you're coming into my home and telling me that I can't record my own conversation in my own home. Now whose rights are being violated? 
your right to privacy is not being violated when you call me at my home, I pick up the phone and record it. My rights are being violated when you come into my home and tell me that if you pick up your phone in your own home and then record it, we're going to arrest you and lock you up for doing that. Okay, That's the part that's wrong. When it comes to technology, laws keep getting made over and over. Unfortunately, I, I know it's a difficult issue to keep up with, but and, and that's why it ha you have to be careful with all of the exceptions. Every new exception that you think is helping, okay, there are thousands, tens of thousands of people, in the, lawyers, geniuses, electronics people, who are looking at that law, they're scrutinizing it, and before it's hot off the press, they've figured out 15 ways to get around it, okay? When, when you talk about an enhanced device, what does that mean? What does that mean? Many cameras already have a built-in. The built-in microphone is an amplifying device that's built into the camera. People don't even know that, okay? How many decibels does it have to be before it's amplified? Some people have hearing aids that amplify beyond the ambient sound a little bit more. It is, in effect, a parabolic mic that they wear everywhere they go. In the future, and, and I don't mean like sci-fi out there, I'm talking about Goodwin's Law coming in 10, 20 years, people are going to be able to have enhanced hearing in their head. What are you going to do about that? What, what are you going to do when, when, when people, they're, they're integrating, okay? There's a gentleman, this has yeah, been going on for four or five years, there's a gentleman who uh, claims to be the first cyborg. He goes, he wears, he has wearable computers, he doesn't go anywhere without them, he has it for years. Everything that he says, does, is completely recorded. They give him hell at the airports. It's a really interesting case, you should check it out. Okay. But yeah, when you're talking about the future of technology, when you start making all of these exceptions, you just can't account for it. It's an expectation of privacy and a reasonable expectation of privacy. If you're a public official, while in the performance of your duties, you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy. If you're in a public place, you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy. If you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy, you can be recorded. If you have a reasonable expectation of privacy, you cannot be recorded. It's that simple. What, what, what creates an expectation? These uh, questions have already been, been answered almost entirely by case law. Um, <clears throat> so, absolutely. Uh, I think there was one other thing that I wanted to mention here. Um, and as far as the, uh, the Edemo trial and the, and the way that the law is currently written, okay, it's, it's not, uh, I don't think, accurate to say that the, um, that the court um, you know, misinterpreted the law or that there was any sort of statement on the law by the jury because I was there and the jury was not presented with the law or given the ability to understand it. Uh, the, the law, as others have pointed out, is very clear that if it's an inter the word interception kind of speaks for itself, like some people watch football, you know what an interception is. It was going from there to there, you got in the middle of it, okay? If you're at the <laughs> end of the conversation, that's not an interception, right? So uh, even though what he did was technically illegal, uh, it definitely was supposed, to, it would, should have been charged under the misdemeanor, not the felony, and the county attorney is the person who is responsible for pushing that forward, who should have known better. A clear reading of the law states that he did not commit the felony, that it was the misdemeanor version, and, this, and, the, and the, the, prosecution, the prosecuting attorney knew better and just went ahead in a very vindictive manner. And I know that doesn't have to do with this bill, um, but it's, uh, that's why the governor should get involved, in my opinion. The judge, knew, the, judge knew, the judge knew that he was wrong, and that's why he sentenced him, even though the state asked for years and all kinds of harsh penalties, the judge, if he were there, just shook his head and sentenced him to 90 days in jail for three felonies. Now, ask yourself, when's the last time someone got convicted of three felonies and the judge disregarded the state's recommendations and gave them 90 days in jail, because he knew that it was BS. William, do you mind taking a question from Yes, I'm sorry. Um, just, just, just a question. I only caught a little bit of 
that on TV because I was out doing the people's work. Um, but he is already incarcerated? Correct. And, and Is that why it was bumped up to a felony? No. No. Do you know that for sure? Yes. yes. Um, in, interestingly, um, the, the state also objected to the sentence running concurrently, and the judge overruled that. And not, so not only did he only sentence him to 90 days, he allowed it to run concurrently uh, with, with his you know, unrelated sentence. So uh, obviously, in the judge's opinion, the man did not belong in jail. Well, he would still be in jail. Well, he would, he would be, yes. Well, for chalking. Well, to clarify, Se he's separation. in jail for chalking and resisting separate. arrest like going limp. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's not unrelated. Yeah, it's totally different cases. Yeah. It's totally different cases. He was sentenced yeah, to two months for chalking. Yeah. Hang on, Carla. Would Bill speak in order to Carla? Chalking. Bill, do you want to water? Using chalk, chalk and writing with chalk. Take a piece of chalk and writing on some sidewalk. Yeah, please. Wash away. Can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Bill Domenico from Manchester. Yeah. And uh, just briefly, I, I looked at the law last night. I was shocked. I was trying to compare the new, the new writing to the original writing, and I was really stunned at how convoluted and uh, and hard to read and compare. My head was spinning by the time I tried to compare all of the eleven pages of the new law versus the nine pages of the old law. That being said, when I was reading the law, <coughs> I realized that I myself have. Can you offer him immunity right now? <laughs> I myself you might know somebody. I myself should be charged with multiple class B felonies. Because by the reading of the law, I've been in the security and surveillance business for 15 years. And by the reading of the law, I'd just be sitting back in my desk chair and looking at what I have on the shelf in my warehouse. <laughs> And knowing that it says mere possession, manufacture, or advertising of devices within, <coughs> with uh, listening capability is a Class B felony. Okay, you better slap the cuffs on me now. Oh, because I've been doing this for 10 years as part of an, in my, my normal line of business. Okay, so that camera that he has is an enhanced listening device. The video cameras at the high school that don't record, I mean, they do well, they don't record that well, those are in listening devices. If you sell those, then by the letter of the law, you've committed a Class B felony. If you possess those, if you make those, I've done all of those things. There are businesses all over Man Manchester that do all of those things. This is crazy. So I was a little shaken up last night after I read this. Moving on from that, I'd like to just as an aside say there's at least three people in this room that have been charged with wiretapping and arrested for it and had to go into court for it. And so I'm tired of hearing the, uh, oh well, you know, this law is okay because we never charge anybody with wiretapping. We never enforce that. It was like a representative told me one time when the Patriot Act was passed, and I said, Do you, are you concerned about the Patriot Act having people arrested on the street, disappeared? It will never come to that. Okay, we all know it, it is coming to that. Our rights are being usurped by the government every single day. The government is recording us anytime, anywhere, by any technology they feel they, they want to bring to bear on us. It's got to stop. We've got to take back our rights. And my plan is simple. On the job, on the record. Thank you, Bill. Did you have one more thing, Carla? We're going to wrap it up. Um, maybe in conclusion, I just want to say, I mean, there's a sense of urgency here, particularly to what Bill has said. Uh, it was, what happened on Monday was a travesty of justice. We've had uh, law enforcement testify, I've been here several times too, to say this doesn't happen, it's not a problem. We know it is. And we know it's a problem because we are trying to keep people accountable. And in the courtroom on Monday, the prosecutor was arguing, well, if you want to change it, if you want to change it, talk to your legislator. I testified here for the first time two and a half years ago when I got arrested in Weir. I've come every time. I have talked to all of you. And it's been two and a half years. And I appreciate that, you know, the wheels of both justice and the state house turn slowly. But I don't want to be here in five years' time saying, why are these things still happening? A man is in a cage for something he should not be, for More than trying one. to hold someone accountable for terrible behavior. 
And the fact that the, a police officer can violate a juvenile's rights that way, and the person who brings it to light is the person in jail, is what's wrong with this entire situation. Yeah. And you guys are the only people who can do it because a prosecutor doesn't want to help us. Right. The jury made a terrible decision, and it's up to you. And this 11-page law is not the solution. On the job, on the record. Thank you. All right. Um, hang on, Bill. I'd like to thank the subcommittee for your indulgence in uh, letting people speak to this issue. But you know, you, I'd like to hear from you guys now how we move forward on this. And if you'd like to ask questions of anybody in the audience, please do. Our, our job as a subcommittee is to recommend either for or against legislation, future legislation regarding this, uh, this bill and this statute. Are we able to amend it? Yes. We're not going to amend it. Oh, no. We don't, that's not our function. We're not going to actually address this specific bill. This bill is in effect dead. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Allery. No, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> got a soft kill. It's dead. All this, all we're going to recommend is to the full committee is the, whether we think that more work should be done, and definitely some new legislation should come forward next year. Is that right, Representative Walsh? That's right. As we've seen in your other subcommittees, right? That's our function. But we can write a report, and my thinking is that uh, while some of the things in the bill are good about uh, updating, updating the language to meet technology, it's more important for us to have legislation that uh, addresses the one party, two party thing, and also definition of public, uh, public official. Those are, I think, a couple of things that I think are key. I'd like to see in our recommendation, and I'd like to hear what you guys think. Representative Walsh? Well, having heard both sides, well, probably three sides actually, <laughs> uh, my feeling is that what we need to do is to first of all look at the right to privacy of the individual and then look at uh, what the arguments have been in this room and, and determine how best to do that. I'm not sure exactly what's the best thing to do. I, I, I'm gonna, uh, when it comes down to it, I'm going to vote to uh, recommend this for future legislation. But at some point, we're going to have to come to grips with all these technological uh, advances that are creating havoc in our society. How we do that, well, we have to protect this private citizen. We have to protect him or her from uh, an invasion of their privacy. How do we do that? Can I clarify one thing? When you say protect, <coughs> Government can't protect anybody from anything. You, so you mean penalize? How do we punish people who do bad things? Well, first of all, we have to determine what is what is happening, and is it a crime? Right. And I think we have to be real careful when we uh, when we deal with this legislation, not to create a, uh, a Gideon's knot, so to speak. It's got to be. Clear and, and simple. Clear and simple? I like that. Well, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's our that's challenge, simple. to make the law simple so that everybody yeah. understands it. Exactly. It's not clear. That's simple, but it's not clear. On the job, on the record. Okay. That's wow. Representative Ginsburg. Uh, I, I agree with uh, Representative Welch that uh, that individuals' privacy is a good starting point. And I think, as we've seen here, and, and as the predominant view seems to be here in the audience, the other thing is to protect uh, the citizen. And of course you're right, but let's use the term protect um, uh, against malfeasance by public officials. The question is defining who is a public official, under what mm -hmm. circumstances is that necessary um, and these are very broad questions because then uh, we also have to deal with all the questions involved with both A, observing, and B, recording um, the, the behavior of an individual, either a private individual or a public official. Um, 
And I would suggest maybe in addition to or, or going beyond the idea of dispensing entirely with the word wiretapping, because at this point it's merely a symbol of how obsolete the existing uh, law is and how irrelevant it is, it is to the way things are now. We should consider a new law, apologies to Representative Ulrey, but I think he, he accepts this now, that goes, that, that really starts over with this whole, whole set of issues and it's a huge job. Um, but New Hampshire could lead the way in this if we deal with the issues. I've just been jotting down while we've been talking about it what the underlying fundamental issues are here. And there are at least ten of them. And each one it would, could be the basis for many, many hours of heated and uh, even, even if you limit it to intelligent discussion, uh, many, many hours. <laughs> um, and of course, a lot of our discussion, as anybody who has been here will know, is, uh, does not meet that standard. <laughs> um, so there, there's a huge job here and a huge <coughs> issue, but a very important one. And uh, a question would be whether we're up to the task of dealing with the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, Rickman, sorry, Representative Antos. I agree with quite a few people in here concerning the uh, one party uh, compared to the, the two party that currently is under law. I think the, the most important thing to remember is is the intent of why something was recorded, audio or video, and I think it should be more specific in a law in the future stating that there was a specific intent on why that re why on how or why that recording was used, um, such in the case that we just ran into on Monday. Um, his intent was not a criminal intent um, by any means, and in my opinion, <coughs> shouldn't, shouldn't even be in jail even for a misdemeanor. At this point. Thank you, and. Uh, Representative Ulrey, since you're the sponsor, do you want to uh, have any last words you want to share with the subcommittee? Yeah, I thank the subcommittee for taking a look at this. The intent of bringing forth uh, this bill was based upon the uh, idiocy that exists within the current law. The gentleman who's recording this right now is technically violating state law, uh, committing a Class B felony by having purchased and possessing the device that records. <laughs> Arrest that man. You didn't sell it to him, did you? <laughs> <laughs> then again, anyone that's got one of these on, on their belt or in their pocket or purse yeah. is I've also. Been, I've got a camcorder. <laughs> As I said earlier, technology has increased. Uh, gentlemen, listen to the, um, uh, the uh, discussions of the, uh, uh, the public, the, the comments that were made. Uh, yes, it's straight away from this bill. I would be happy to work, uh, assuming re-election, on um, introducing several uh, pieces of legislation. 553 should be eliminated or rewritten in its entirety. I think we agree on that. Uh, as for the definition of public official, I don't think 553 is the place for that. I think that goes either into a, a general uh, definition of terms, uh, someplace else, but it's probably a good idea. Um, when I heard that the school principal said he wasn't a public official, she, she, she. Um, does that then mean that public money isn't being used to pay him? Right. Um, that, that's that's, that's where a lot of places come from. <laughs> but that's, that's an issue away from this. But so I, I thank you for bringing those points up. Yeah, thank you for being here. So what this brings up is, question for us the subcommittee on what to recommend. And I thought, Dave, you might have some recommendations, because I don't think we can simply say, yeah, 553 was sort of a good idea. We recommend, the committee recommend similar legislation. Uh, Representative Valerie just said it's several different pieces. And I think that's the only way to do it. Maybe we should have several. Well, we should recommend different types of things, one addressing what definition of public official, one uh, addressing single party versus two party, one uh, the one uh, addressing the definition of what's reasonable uh, expectation of privacy. So 
Well, Dave, what do you think uh, oh. we should do in regards to our actual recommendation to the main committee? Uh, essentially, you know, we, we talked about, and you answered the question correctly, can we amend it? No, we cannot amend it, but we can make recommendations for, for another law to come up in the next session. We can uh, write a draft of what that, that law should contain, and, and it probably should be more than one bill. Uh, I can remember back in 1988 when we had a, the existing law at that time was that you could possess fireworks, but you couldn't set them off. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of right. a stupid thing. <laughs> and we had a bill come in to prohibit fireworks altogether in New Hampshire, so we put it into a subcommittee and we changed the bill and we opened it up. Because we weren't thinking clearly at the time, we opened it up and they were selling fireworks out of the backs of station wagons and everywhere you could think of and there were all kinds of fireworks. We have taken that back. We now have a fireworks industry that is thriving and now they're selling almost everything that is produced. And it's working. And I think even though this is a different subject, if we take that approach and don't just make a slap dab uh, attempt at it that could create problems. And what we need to do is to anticipate those problems and, and work carefully to produce probably three or four bills to, to deal with. Public official, is a public official somebody who gets paid with taxpayer money? Yes. Is that, well, is that yes, always sir. accurate? It could be. Right, what about, uh, you know this, what about Organizations that are set up to receive grant money that comes from exactly. the state. Seth has done a lot of stuff on that. Yeah, and I think that we have to be kind of careful how who we call a public official. Yeah, um, it has to be a little bit more than just receiving taxpayer money. It probably has to do with, with the type of job he's doing. Now, I think the principal is a public official, but <laughs> if he doesn't think so, then I hope he finds work somewhere else. <laughs> but uh, I think that, that the approach that we can take is that we can uh, create a draft of the three or four bills that we could recommend as part of that report. You think the four of us can scratch something out today, or should we? I don't think we can do it today. I think we need to think about it a little bit. That's what I do is to think about it and uh, email some ideas on the main topics we want to have considered that probably are worthy of their own separate legislation, mm -hmm. and then come back and refine that. Just be careful on your emails. <laughs> 91A. Well, depends. 91A in Massachusetts is purple damages on a civil complaint, so. <laughs> uh, just as a comment, uh, Representative Welsh worked with me on a, uh, on a modification of 106F. And that took us, unfortunately, six oh, years. Wow. It took us quite a while. Uh, yeah, it took about six years, yeah. So I would urge the audience not to expect instantaneous results out of any legislative body. But I think we can get some good stuff done. We're limited to two years to get things done. The first year is, is pretty heavy into the budget, and then it leaves only about six months in the second year to get and The first year is a good year to do things, but everybody is distracted by the budget. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how 106 that finally passed. But, um, in this particular instance, uh, you can, I believe, um, Phil or Dave, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you as the subcommittee chair can call additional subcommittee meetings throughout the summer until well, you can, fall. You can do as many as you need. Until yeah. such time this as, summer. yeah, until such time as the report is due, which is right. November 1st. No, no, it won't be in November. We're meeting in October, the yeah. main committee. So we'd have to have it out by then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, because yeah, that's right. Cause it's and we good. try to give two weeks notice so it gets into the House calendar so the, course, the public knows that we're going to have a meeting. Yeah. And the public should also know that if you have a uh, committee meeting of the type that you uh, anticipate, their comments would be uh, most appreciated in writing. 
but uh, the rest of the time would be spent working on language within the context of the proposed legislation so that you have something that can be submitted either in the uh, December filing period or in the uh, September filing period. You're not going to get that by September. All right, let's do that then. Let's uh, call this meeting and then as we did before, we'll try to set the we'll set up a time for the next meeting by two weeks hence, more or less. You guys are okay with that? We'll be able to finish up the light the recommendation at that time. No. We'll need at least two more. <laughs> so you guys see how slowly the wheels of um, government grind. It's it's ridiculous. Horrible. Yeah, Which is a good thing because you don't want fast legislation. Well, I guess that's true, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard to get rid of bad stuff. Good stuff. We can't even. Yeah. Yeah. We can it would be nice if we can get justice on the. On we can't the way even write a recommendation though. for uh, you know, nothing. <laughs>